Amen. Thank you once again, Brother Bell, for blessing us with your gift. We greatly appreciate it. Tonight, we go through our final part of Jonah. We are going to be in Jonah chapter 4. But before we begin, I want to briefly fill you guys in on what happened. Um, I can't really go into all the applications and conclusions we came through from the story, because guess what? That would take us quite a few hours to do that. But I want to go through the story of Jonah so we know where we're at in this narrative. And even beyond that, I want to make sure that people who are not here and perhaps aren't familiar with the story of Jonah can understand where we're at in this narrative. And so, the book of Jonah starts out with God giving this call to Jonah to go to Nineveh. He says, hey, the wickedness of Nineveh is great, and I need you to go there. Go there for. But Jonah, for reasons we may find out in a second, just a little bit, but for reasons we did not know at the time, perhaps the wickedness of Jonah, uh, Nineveh, perhaps he thought it was useless going there, perhaps he thought it was dangerous, but for whatever reason, he says, no, I do not want to go to Nineveh. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes down to Joppa to get on a ship to go to Tarshish. Now, as Kenai pointed out in his first I think it was his first presentation. It was almost comical because if you looked where he was at to where Nineveh was and to where Tarshish was, Nineveh was like from here to here compared to Tarshish being all the way over here. I'm not a geography major, so that's the best I can give you. It was closer to go to Nineveh. But he says, no, I'm going to go all the way to Tarshish because he did not want to go to Nineveh. And so he goes on a ship and... uh, he goes to Joppa, gets in a ship that's going to take him to Tarshish. Uh, a raging storm starts to happen as he is sleeping. They get up. They come to the conclusion that, hey, this is because, Jonah, you are rebelling against your God. So eventually they come to the conclusion that they're going to throw Jonah into the water. Everybody thought he was going to die, but the Lord prepared a fish. The fish eats him. While he's in the belly of this fish, we see that he has this prayer to God, whether it's a very sincere prayer or not, we don't know, uh, but he has this prayer with God. Eventually, God pretty much drops him off where he needs to go, and he takes the journey to Nineveh. When he goes to Nineveh, he tells them, hey, repent. Um, all the people of Nineveh do repent, and that takes us to chapter 4. Chapter 3 ends with God relenting and showing mercy to Nineveh because they repented. Before we begin chapter 4, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne right now, thanking you for this opportunity to finish our our deep dive into the book of Jonah. We thank you for what you've taught us thus far, and we thank you for what you're going to teach us tonight. May we apply what you teach us to our lives, and may we have a gut check with ourselves, to know where our mindset is at. Help us to realize whether our mindset is that of Jonah's or that of Moses. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jonah, chapter 4, we're starting in verse 1. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry, this being the fact that God relented and did not destroy Nineveh. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when, he was, when, when I was in my, still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So up to this point in the story, we haven't ex- explicitly seen why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. As we stated before, perhaps it's because he thought it was dangerous. Perhaps it was because he thought it was a useless um, venture. But we see here that Jonah says explicitly why he did not want to go to Nineveh, or at least one of the reasons why he did not go to Nineveh. Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm, or one who relents from punishing. 
And so we see here that Jonah is throwing a little bit of a fit because he thought that God should have destroyed Nineveh. But instead, he is showing grace to Nineveh. And one thing to notice here in this verse is that the words he uses here, gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, is almost certainly him quoting a story that is pivotal in Jewish history. And that is the story of Moses at Mount Sinai. If you guys aren't familiar with the story, what happened is Moses was going up to Mount Sinai to get the commandments from God. But while he was up there on Mount Sinai, what happened was the people down at the base of the mountain started, I guess, they saw that Moses was delaying so much and they said, hey, Aaron, make us a God that we can worship. And so what happens is uh, God says to him, hey, your pe- uh, the people down at the base of the mountain, they are basically acting a fool. And what was happening was, we can find a lot of Hebrew scholars and stuff will tell you that they were not only creating gods, they were not only playing, like the text says, but they were almost having a race rave party. They were almost having an orgy here at the base of the mountain. And so, as they're going down, Joshua even says, hey, this looks like this sounds like the sounds of war cry, but he says no, that's the sounds of them of that's the sounds of pleasure, that's the sounds of playing. And so they were at the base of the mountain basically having this orgy and God, God says, "Hey, you need to go down there." And so when Moses goes down there, sees what's going on, he throws the 10 commandments down signifying that the covenant has been broken. And so after he spends some time with him, he goes back up to the top of Mount Sinai to talk with God again and here is what he says to God. He says, in Exodus 34, starting in verse 6, he says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for fa- thousand, forgiving the iniquity and transgression of sin, and by no means clearing the guilty. And so here we see a pretty similar uh, similarities from what jo- uh, Jonah was saying. He was like, hey, you're gracious, you're merciful. All these characteristics, the same characteristics that Moses used. But what did Jonah said? He said, One who does not punish. But here we have Moses that says, hey, you're merciful, you're gracious, you do all these things, but you punish. You by no means clear the guilty. And so Joseph is quoting this story, quoting quoting these characteristics for God that Moses did, and he quotes them all, except he says, instead of Moses, he said, how Moses says, hey, you do punish, you by no means clear the guilty. He says, but you don't punish. Very interesting. Very interesting. And so, Jonah basically gave God an ultimatum. At the end, he says, basically, it would be better for me to die. And so, what do I mean by he gave him an ultimatum? He basically said, hey, you need to destroy them, or I'm going to die. It's them or me. Choose me, the chosen, a, a Jew of the chosen people. Don't choose the Ninevites. And so he says, hey, here's my ultimatum. You either change your mind and destroy them, or I will die. But here we see Moses' narrative that Moses has a much different stance toward this. He says in uh, Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 30, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And so here we have Jonah. He's quoting Moses saying, you're just, you're merciful, you're kind, you're gracious, but you don't punish. And then we have Moses saying, you're just, you're merciful, you're gracious, you're loving, but you do punish. And then we have here that Jonah is saying, hey, you need to destroy them or I'm going to die. But here Moses is saying, please don't destroy them. Let me take the punishment instead. Joseph was directly quoting this pivotal story in Jewish history, yet he had it all backwards. Let's continue in the Jonah narrative. 
Uh, chapter, verse 4, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out to the city, sat on the east side of the city, there he made himself a shelter, and sat under it till, uh, till he might see what would become of the city. And so, Jonah throws his little temper tantrum. He gives the ultimatum, and he goes east to the city. We can get to the, the theological reasons why he went east. East is obvious, um, often in Scripture the place where people go to be alone and in rebellion. Just to give a few examples, Cain went to the east to be alone and in rebellion. Lot went toward Sodom to the east to be almost alone and almost in rebellion. And so we see that east is the place to be alone in rebellion. And so Jonah, he separates himself from this conversation with God after he gives him this ultimatum, and he goes up to sit under the shelter to see what would become of the city. One thing I want you guys to notice about Moses' heart for God in the narrative of Mount Sinai was that he was concerned for the salvation of his people and for the reputation of God. In Exodus 32, verse 11, he says, Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Would the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out of harm to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your, faith, turn, turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. And so Moses was concerned for the people and the salvation of the people and for the reputation of God, and he was willing to lay his life down for it. But Jonah, on the other hand, was not concerned for the salvation of anybody else, and he was not concerned for the reputation of God. He was worried about himself and himself alone. And I want to add, I was going to say at the beginning, last time I was up here, we talked about the ways in which Jonah is, the type, is a type of Christ. Whereas today, we're looking at ways he is nothing like Christ. So Moses was worried about the salvation of the people and the reputation of God. And a commentary in the book Prophets and Kings in this story, the writer says, When Jonah learned God's purpose to spare the city that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinite greater value of the souls in the wretched city. Moses was concerned for the reputation of God and the salvation of others. Jonah did not care about the salvation of others or the reputation of God. He was worried about himself. So, Let's finish out the book of Jonah. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose, God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he, and he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and per, uh, came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern their right hand and their left in much livestock? That is the end of Jonah. It ends on a question. Very weird way to end a book. I would never ever in my life would think of writing an account for something and ending it with a question. But that is intentional because the listener and the readers of this narrative are left with the question basically for themselves. And we're going to find out what that question is. But we are supposed to find ourselves in the crosshairs of this narrative asking the question for ourselves. 
But what happened here? So Jonah, God prepares a tree to come up and cover Jonah from the heat of the sun. And so Jonah, he appreciated that, did he not? Hey, it's hot out here in this desert. I appreciate that tree. But then the Lord also, uh, the Lord also prepared a worm to wither that tree and die. Jonah didn't like that. Why would you do that to me? Why would you take away the tree from me? And so notice this. Jonah, when given grace, was all about it. When uh, God prepared the tree for him that he did not labor for, that he did not deserve, that he did nothing to earn, Jonah was all okay for it. But then when God took it away, the tree, took away the tree that Jonah had not done anything to earn, he's, he was all about, dang, why do you have to show this justice? Jonah was for grace when it suited him and for justice only when it suited him. Only when it suited him. And I want to make one point about Jonah's ultimatum to God. Kevin J. Youngblood, an author, says in his book, Jonah, God's mercy, Jonah's situation jeopardized only one person, himself. The consequences of death in the desert would be relatively insignificant. Yet Jonah recognized that even the individual is a legitimate object of Yahweh's mercy and that the removal of that mercy is tragic. Now that's pretty beautiful. Jonah recognized that God was a God that although his death compared to the death of thousands and thousands and thousands would be insignificant, that God recognized even individuals as legitimate objects of his mercy. And that God removing that mercy would be tragic. He continues, Destruction would have jeopardized thousands of people and animals. Yahweh could no more abide the thought of rescinding his mercy for that city than Jonah abide the thought of losing Yahweh's mercy himself. And so Jonah gave this ultimatum to God. You choose them, or you choose me, knowing that the God we serve is worried about the salvation of one person just as much as the salvation of every of a group of people. Jonah wants God to punish the wicked, but only when it suits him. Jonah also wants God to extend grace, but only when it suits him. Jonah wanted grace when it came to him having the tree over his head. Jonah wanted justice, though, when it came to the destruction of the Ninevites. He was more worried about getting a sunburn on his head than the salvation and lives of thousands of people. Kevin Youngblood also says in his book, Yahweh demonstrates to Jonah the inconsistency of his position. Jonah reserves the right to be distressed over his experience of unmitigated divine justice, but disallows Yahweh's right to be distressed over the prospect of executing such justice on Nineveh. So Jonah wants divine justice on Nineveh, but divine grace for himself. He was unworried. He was more worried, like we said, about getting a sunburn on his head than the salvation and eternal lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of others. Beloved, I want to say that we can oftentimes be too much like Jonah. Before I elaborate on that, I want to read these quotes from Youngblood because very, very eloquent way of getting this point that I want to make across. He says, believers like Jonah are often tempted to view God's reluctant wrath as indecisiveness or inconsistency. This perspective, however, is an indication that faith has turned inward, that believers have lost sight of the bigger picture of God's redemptive activity. We are reminded of the universal scope of God's compassion, 
believers are to balance their eagerness for the consummation of God's kingdom. In other words, the second coming of Jesus expressed in the prayer, Lord, come quickly with a long suffering that desires along with God to see everyone come to repentance. Prayer is often a painful collision of a believer's impatient hope with God's patient grace. The memory of our own salvation enables us to embrace the scandal of God's patient mercy as we impatiently anticipate and pray for our Lord's return. So Youngblood's making the point, just like Jonah, often us as believers can be so eager for the second coming of Jesus that our worry about our relationship with God comes so inward that we are not putting in perspective God's perspective of redemptive, his redemptive plan of the whole universe. Just like Jonah was more worried about getting a sunburn on his head in his time in the wilderness as one person, he had no regard for the thousands and thousands and thousands that would be destroyed. The second coming may be good news for us, beloved, but for many others, it's not so good news. Have we made our walk with God so inward that we are so comfortable with our state, or the state of our walk with God, that we are so eager for him to come, not worrying about all those who have yet to be saved. Friends, we should long for the soon coming of Jesus. But if we're longing for it without working for it, we are just like Jonah. Everyone around us, we are viewing as Ninevites. Hey, God, come right now. Come right now. Those people, they're not going to accept you anyway. Just come. I'm ready. I'm ready. But God has shown in this story that the Ninevites, some of the most wicked people, they were able to repent in a day. So friends, let's not be, we should long for the soon coming and understand that it is imminent. But we should not long for it so much to the point that we forget that there are Ninevites out there that still need to be saved. Yes, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. But we should be also praying, Lord, help me to do what I need to do to uh, help you come quickly. There are Ninevites out there that need to be saved. God sees the big picture that we do not see. He sees the heart to each and every individual. Someone that we may see as a lost cause in God's eyes is someone who has a heart softened enough that Dennis or Bell or Cassandra or Samantha or Rodney, if they come up and tell them about Jesus, that is someone who might see the kingdom of heaven. And so, yes, Jesus, come quickly. Jesus, come quickly. But also, Jesus, tell me what I need to do to help you come quickly. Are we so worried or are we so satisfied to where we are in our walk with God that we want Jesus to come quickly without us doing any work? Friends, Jesus loves the Ninevites just as much as he loves each and every single one of you. Each and every one of us were Ninevites at one point in our lives. But if Christ came before we, like the Ninevites, repented, we probably wouldn't be saying, Jesus, come soon. Jesus, come soon. Jesus, come soon. And it is okay to look forward to the second coming of Christ. And more importantly, it is okay to understand that he is coming soon. But let us not get so selfish that we are longing for his soon coming at the stake of the eternal lives of the Ninevites. In our brain, we may not see that those Ninevites have softened their heart to the point where they can be converted. But God does. I want to end Jonah's series with this one question. It was a short, short message to wrap it up, but I think this message 
gets across what we're looking for? Are we merely longing for the Jesus' second coming, or are we working for Jesus' second coming? Because those are two very different things. Are we just longing, Jesus come soon, Jesus come soon, Jesus come soon? Or are we saying, God, I may not understand why you're delaying your soon coming. I may not understand why, in the midst of all this pain, suffering, and disaster, why we still have to be here and still have to live this life. But I trust that you see the hearts of the Ninevites right now. You see those souls who will be converted. So rather than me sitting here saying, come now for my sake, until you come, help me to do the work you called me to do and put me in the path of every Ninevite that you want to call to repentance as a result of the work you do through me. Can I said that one of the pivotal sentences in this book was found in Jonah, uh, Jonah 2, where Jonah finally exclaims, salvation or deliverance belongs to Yahweh. And so friends, trust that salvation belongs to Yahweh. We don't know when he's going to come. We know he's coming soon. But let's not be comfortable thinking that we are ready for a second coming. So comfortable that we're not worried about the salvation and the eternal light of the Ninevites. Beloved, are we longing for Jesus' second coming or are we working for Jesus' second coming? Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you now. At times, it's hard to trust God. It's hard to understand why he hasn't come back for his people yet. God, there's so much pain. There's so much suffering. There's so much tor turmoil. Please come, Lord Jesus. Only trust him. Only trust him. We don't know why he hasn't come yet. We kind of do, but if we find ourselves in the season of our life doubting that Jesus is coming soon, only trust him. If we find ourselves in a season of our lives where we feel like we can no longer make it to tomorrow on this, same, this sinful world, only trust him. We do not know why God is doing what he's doing, but we can trust that he sees the big picture, that he sees the Ninevites of this world who have a heart prepared to hear the gospel. Only trust him he will save you. Only trust you. Only trust him. He's longing to save others too. So my appeal is simple. Let us understand that Christ's return is in fact imminent. Let us understand that his second coming is indeed going to happen soon. But let us also understand that Christ wants to see every single Ninevite savable Ninevite saved and that us longing for the soon coming without working for the soon coming reeks of the selfishness that Jonah had worrying about grace extended to him but not to the Ninevites so let's long for the soon coming of Jesus, but let's put that longing to work. We want Jesus to come soon. I'm sick and tired of this sinful world. I'm sick and tired of the pain and suffering that we see every single day. 
I'm sick and tired of seeing my loved one hurting. I'm sick and tired of seeing all the disaster strike around the world. I'm sick and tired of people thinking that the devil has won because they're going through a trial in life. I'm sick and tired of it all, and I'm sure you guys are too. I want Jesus to come quickly. But let's put that desire to see Jesus come quickly to work so that way we can see every savable human being saved. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we long for your soon coming. You see this sinful world. You see the pain and suffering that we all endure. And this was not the way you intended it to be. Nevertheless, you are delaying your coming to see every savable human saved. Help us not to be so caught up in our salvation that we forget about the salvation of others. Help us to not merely have an inward longing for your second coming so that way we may be saved. But may we have an outward love to show to the world so that way they may be saved when you do indeed come. Help us to not be like Jonah. Help us to be like Moses. Worried about the way people see you and worried about the salvation of others. We thank you for the love and mercy and grace you have shown each and every one of us. Help us to show that love and grace and mercy to every person we come in contact with. And Lord, we all are saying here today, we want you to come quickly. Instead of saying that in a selfish way, though, we are saying we want you to come quickly. Put us to work so that can happen. As we leave this place, may we not leave with a mere desire to see you come quickly, but may we leave with a desire to help others to want to see you come quickly. Whatever you want us to do, wherever you want us to go, whomever you want us to meet, we surrender ourselves to you right now. Thank you, God for saving us. Help us now to go out and work on your behalf for the salvation of your beloved people. In Jesus' name, amen.